Let's go through the mechanism here. So I came up with, I got a carboxylic acid. Uh, let's see. Good. There's one small problem with that, but uh, that's understandable because that's an issue we haven't talked about. Everything we've talked about before, um, we figured it out here. So now, sorry? Does it have to do with the uh, chloride? Something separate. Oh. So, yeah, we'll get to that in a second. It's something that we haven't quite talked about before. Anyway, what, what's the name of this? Well, what type of functional group did we start with here? Uh, an amide? Yeah. And what type of functional group is this? Um, oh, well, we got a carboxylic acid. Good. What's the name of this general type of reaction? Um, a hydrolysis. Yeah, this would be an amide hydrolysis. Okay. Now, um, are amides some of the more reactive carboxylic acids or less reactive? Less reactive. In fact, they're just about the least reactive. That explains why this hydrolysis requires not just a catalyst, but also heat. Uh, we never said that any of the other hydrolyses required heat. 
but it's not surprising that this requires stronger conditions because this is one. This is the least reactive of, of the uh, of the basic types of carboxylic acid derivative. So that's a point that's worth knowing. Um, you started with the protonation because we were in acidic conditions. That was good. That makes this more electrophilic. Um, and you're getting very good here at not losing sight of the L group. In fact, you're, you're specifically labeling very early on who the L group is. So that's good so you don't lose track of it. You did a good proton transfer here. Why do we need this to become positive before it can leave to be consistent with the conditions? If this left while it was neutral, it would become negative. But you're not allowed to have a negative intermediate under acidic conditions. So you had to protonate it before it could leave. All right, and then in your last step, you deprotonated this oxygen. And who did you use to deprotonate the oxygen? The negative chlorine. Right. Now, that, that's, uh, that's perfectly reasonable. Um, but let's look at this in another point of view. Um, so your, your ultimate outcome here is a carboxylic acid. Now, we've seen that carboxylic acids actually have two different forms, protonated and deprotonated. And you have to use the form that's consistent with the conditions. Um, is this the correct form under these conditions? Yes. Yeah. The deprotonated form, this is the normal protonated form. It's never going to stick with this proton. The deprotonated form would be the carboxylates. This is correct. Now, something we haven't talked about is that amines and ammonia also have two different forms. Okay. Um, now, why does this have two different forms? Because it's an acid. So it can either have its proton or lose its proton. We've briefly mentioned before, though, that amines and ammonia are bases. Since amines and ammonia are bases, they have two different forms as well, either protonated or not protonated. And you have to be consistent with the conditions. So this is something that will probably come up on, that uh, probably will come up on the next exam. Your instructor talked about it in the lecture. And it's going to be important again when you do amino acids and peptides later on. All right, so anyway, this is a base. It should be either have either a protonated or deprotonated form. Well, under these conditions, should this be protonated or deprotonated? It should be protonated. So this is the best thing to use to take this proton. If you wanted to, you could have the chloride take the proton, and then you could have the hydrochloric protonate this, but it's faster. Just to show the ammonia taking the proton. Now, we know that after the ammonia takes the proton, since it started neutral and it's losing electrons, it's going to have a positive charge, and now it's ammonium. Even though this is the most interesting product because it's organic, actually, um, instructors are often interested in getting this product right as well. Okay, so that was the only difficulty in um, how you uh, went through that, and we haven't talked about that issue before. So I think you're, you're in the habit now of always checking whether you should have a, a carboxylic acid or a carboxylate based on the conditions. But now we also have to get in the habit of checking whether we should have an amine or ammonia or an ammonium. All right, so here we have the ammonium to be consistent with those conditions. Why don't we give a name to this? What's the name of this compound? Take your time and work out the name. Two, uh, two phenol butonamide. Butonamide. The second thing you said was right. Okay. Good. Two phenol but and amide. Very good. This is a phenol substituent. It's on the number two carbon. There's four carbons here, so that's but, notable bond, so it's an, and you remember that the suffix for amides is amide. Excellent. Oh, what's the name of this? Two phenol uh, butanolic uh, acid. Yeah, the suffix for here is oic acid. That's good. That's good progress on nomenclature. All right, so we learned. Uh, uh, so this is a little bit different from the earlier hydrolyses because this is not very reactive. It requires heat, and because one of the products is an amine or an ammonia, you have to get the right form. So for those that. little things throw me off on a test. If I yeah. had you not mentioned something about that, right, you can completely confuse you about the whole problem. Yep, yep, I can totally see that. All right, so well, it's good that we had a chance to, uh, to go over that. Um, now, it's very important to know this mechanism, but you were right that it's also important to be able to get the product without the mechanism. Well, who's the L group in this compound? The uh, hydroxyl. Yeah, now where did the hydroxyl come from in, in this water. part? Yeah, 
All right, so the key thing that you could go through this, you could get this without doing the whole mechanism, as long as you remember that the water is going to be deprotonated at some point. So the water is not introducing an OH2, it's introducing an OH. So it actually would be quite easy to go straight from here to here without doing the whole mechanism, even though it is important to know the mechanism. Okay, and it's also important to realize that after this leaves, it, it's not an NH2 anymore, it's an NH3. And actually, in this case, it even becomes an NH4. So that was anhydrolysis under acidic conditions. <laughs>